Paolo Cremonesi, Professor of Recommender Systems, and Mauricio da Crema, Postdoctoral Researcher at Politecnico di Milano, where they have a Recommender Systems Research Group headed by Paolo. Welcome both to the Data Exchange Podcast. So thanks, thanks uh, Ben. So thanks the big topic, big topic for this episode is Recommender Systems. Um, uh, my two guests have written two excellent survey papers, which we will uh, discuss in detail. Um, but as a baseline, gentlemen, let's uh, let's uh, kind of just give a very brief uh, a review for our listeners of recommender systems. So people have heard about the different algorithms, right? Collaborative filtering and so on and so forth. Um, so what are some, how would, if you were to dis, uh, organize the space of recommender systems, how would you, how would you organize it? So what kind of taxonomy would you give for someone? Oh, oh well, uh, that's a, a good uh, question. You can organize a taxonomy based uh, on the technology uh, that you can use uh, to build uh, uh, a recommender system. Uh, but uh, uh, I would like to, you know, to organize a taxonomy from the point of view of uh, the application domain or the goal of the recommended system. Uh, so, uh, for instance, uh, the simplest uh, use case is what we call the top K or top N recommended system, where you, you wish to uh, recommend uh, uh, a number of items uh, uh, from a catalog of items. Uh, uh, and uh, typically, the only information you, you use uh, to build these uh, recommended systems are the interactions, the past interactions between uh, uh, the users and the items in the catalog. But you can have uh, more um, sophisticated recommended systems, for instance, if you want to build a session-based recommended systems uh, uh, in which uh, you want to, to predict, uh, for instance, uh, which item, which product uh, the user will, will put in the shopping chart or will buy based on the clicks that the user is, is performing uh, within uh, a specific user session on the, on the interface. Um, so this is a challenging, more challenging task. And um, recently uh, uh, there is uh, this um, hype, uh, but it's a positive hype of uh, building recommended systems uh, which are able to take advantage of unstructured data or multimedia data. So, for instance, maybe you want to recommend a movie based on you know, the analysis of the content of the video of the movie. So you, you want to use, in this case, for instance, deep learning again to extract uh, some features that you can use to recommend uh, movies similar to the movies that the user watched in the past. So these are examples. But generally, generally uh, it seems like there's two sources, two big buckets for sources of signals. One is the items themselves, something about the items. And then the second big bucket is something about the users. Correct, that's correct, exactly. Yeah, at the very end, you can, you can, you know, all the families and the techniques can be simplified in this way. You, you have a set of item features and a set of user features and you try to combine them. <laughs> and uh, so uh, the two of you, uh, have written a couple of papers specifically about uh, or kind of uh, uh, reviewing uh, the entry of deep learning into this space. Um, so the first one, uh, and I will link, uh, listeners, I will link to both of these papers in the episode notes, is called, Are We Really Making Much Progress? A Worrying Analysis of Recent Neural uh, Recommendation Approaches. Um, so walk me through uh, what prompted you to write this first paper. And uh, as, as many of our listeners can tell from the title, uh, it kind of hints at some of the findings in the paper. So what led to this paper? Well, I don't know, Maurizio, uh, if, you want, if you want to go ahead with this. 
Thanks. Uh, well, um, it's it was essentially um, observations on uh, um, well, um, our main research topic is recommender system, and at the time I was working on um, hybrid models, so ways to combine content and collaborative information. And a few articles were being published uh, related to neural models used to combine these features. No, Mauricio, ways. what what, what yes. year what year is this that uh, you're describing? Uh, 2018, I believe. And um, so we tried some of them. We tried to to see whether we were able to use them and to develop uh, on them new uh, techniques and new strategies. But w we encountered a number of issues. Um, so wait, wait, out... wait. Quick, yes, quick question for the people who are not familiar with recommenders. When you say try, so in recommenders, is there kind of like an image net? Is there a data set where all the recommender people uh, no. tr uh, uh, try is, uh... and try and publish against? No. Let's say that there is a pool of data sets, uh, dozens of them. Some are more common than others. Uh, for example, a very common data set is uh, MovieLens. It's a family of four data sets, I believe, uh, of uh, movie recommendations. But uh, if you look at two different papers in the recommender system literature, it's likely that they will have no data set in common. So anyway, sorry for, about that. So you started trying some of these. Uh, uh, so 2018 neural networks started to appear and you started trying them and then what? Yes. Um, and it turned out that we couldn't get them to work. So. Uh, we had trouble in reproducing the results as reported in the original papers, and we couldn't find a way to um, use them effectively for the type of data that we had. Consider that we are using very uh, highly structured data. So we have essentially a table of interactions and a table of features. And so we started wondering whether um, if this was just, uh, we were just observing a wider problem. Uh, issues in methodology and reproducibility date back a decade or more uh, from and, the and, and, not, of... and not not confined to recommenders. Not at all. Artificial intelligence, machine learning in general, this is a, a very wide problem. Psychology, chemistry, you can go as, as wide as you like. Um, and so we wondered, what if we try to do a methodical analysis of articles published in uh, in the literature about neural models? and see whether we are able to reproduce them, to confirm their findings, and uh, in order to have an assessment of what is actually going on. You previously asked whether there is an image net in our field. The fact that there is not is actually one of the issues because you have many papers evaluated in different ways. So comparing them is somewhat opaque and it is difficult to know uh, which one is improving on which. So this is the, the motivation. And then, um, so when you say you couldn't get it to work on your own data, um, so I myself, my first reaction would be maybe it's me. <laughs> yes, and uh, Precisely. I, I, I can tell you, I can tell you that I was pushing Maurizio. I was saying, "Oh my God, Maurizio! You know, everyone uh, outside is able to to run these algorithms and have uh, nice results. Uh, how is it possible that you are not able to?" To, to implement them in the correct way so that they are doing better than a, a very simple baseline. So, <laughs> so this so, first so this this first paper um, so you so you went through a bunch of published uh, results in recommenders at the time using deep learning uh, and as I uh, recall from the paper they were actually even uh, published at the top conferences. Yes. And then um, so you can't write a survey paper and say and say we couldn't reproduce them, right? So that's a one-page paper. So what else is what else did you folks lay out in this first paper? Well, uh, we tried to do an analysis that was as detailed and as transparent as possible. So we took those papers one by one, we analyzed them, and we tried to see whether we uh, were able to reproduce them. And if not, we provided a motivation for why. Uh, for example. Um, the authors provided the source code, but the source code didn't work for some reason. Um, so we contacted the authors for assistance and we tried to engage in a conversation to see whether we, we were able to address the, the issue. Um, 
unfortunately, um, we, well, the majority of articles did not provide sufficient information. So we got stuck at some point and we were not able to uh, contact the authors for assistance. So the, we could only reproduce, I think, uh, in the first paper, um, five articles. Out of? Out of uh, 12, I oh. believe. So it's less than 50%, which is somewhat low, but is in line with what was observed in other studies in artificial intelligence, for example. And for the reproducible or, or, papers... Or, or, or computer science, when the... Mm -hmm. when uh, when the, as Paolo would attest, when the graduate student l graduates, then it's over. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Uh, um. so, so then five out of 12. And then I guess, as I recall, of the five out of 12, you got results that were not uh, that impressive. Is that correct? No. Um, well, what we tried to do is we tried to um, do an analysis that was as conservative as possible. So we tried to use exactly the same methodology, exactly the same uh, implementation, um, exactly the same data split and so on. But then we included some baselines, some simple, uh, in some cases, 20 year old the nearest neighbor baselines. Um, and we tried to see how well they performed in the evaluation scenario that was designed by the authors, the original uh, authors themselves. And we encounter cases, many cases where simple, very simple baselines were able to outperform the recommendation quality measured with different, uh, different accuracy and ranking metrics of the, the newly complex proposed model. There was one remarkable case where Every single algorithm uh, was outperformed by a simple model, non-personalized, which rec recommends to all users the same items. So that was a scenario where it didn't make sense to try personalized recommendation in this way. And uh, we were surprised that such uh, cases could occur in the, in the published literature. Um, unfortunately, it looks like Simple but well-performing models have disappeared in favor of, of more complex ones, which are more difficult to tune, more difficult to optimize. And the result is that in almost all cases, the baselines that were, um, that were um, reported in the published papers were weak, much weaker than the actual state of the, <clears throat> the, actual state of the art. So, Paolo, you folks uh, uh, drafted this paper, started circulating it, and uh, most likely started even giving talks about it. So what was the reaction in the recommender community? Well, uh, there were two type, uh, types of reactions. Uh, uh, I would say that most of the community um, somehow oh, considered this work uh, as, uh, as useful uh, uh, to somehow to, you know, to help the community in improving the research practice uh, and, and, and most important, the evaluation methodology that you use to evaluate uh, recommended systems. Um, a small part of the community did consider this uh, as a kind of attack on deep learning techniques, uh, which was not the case. Uh, uh, because uh, you know, we, we, we decided to focus on deep learning just because we we we, we had to narrow somehow. Okay, but uh, maybe this methodologic methodological issues in the reproducibility uh, of machine learning techniques in recommended systems. I believe is is not limited to deep learning. Okay, and uh, so. Um, but I would say that uh, from the general point of view, the reaction was uh, a positive one, a constructive one. Uh, uh, the, the, the here, uh, following the publication of our paper, I, I was reviewing papers at Rexis, which is the main conference on recommended systems. And I clearly saw the difference in the methodological approach used by researchers in building the experiments from one year to another year. They, you know, many researchers were um, using somehow the, the guidelines and the lesson learned from our paper in order to do better experiments. And uh, so in general, um, so you, you folks uh, published your first paper and then uh, you followed it up. So the first paper was, uh, 
a worrying analysis of recent neural recommendation approaches. Uh, this was in 2019. And then this year you have another paper, uh, a troubling analysis of reproducibility and progress in recommendation systems research. So uh, Paolo, this seems, this seems to contradict, the title of this paper seems to contradict what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> there's still no. a trouble there's still trouble in the in uh, in uh, recommender it, it, research yeah. no because truly speaking uh, you know uh, the the first paper uh, was part of a bigger project overall uh, this uh, this huge work uh, mostly done by Maurizio lasted uh, um, you know almost three years uh, and uh, so mm, we we it took a while for us to to be able to go through uh, all of the deep learning papers dealing with top end recommender system. So, so, um, oh, so by the way, I give our listeners a sense of, uh, so based on what Mauricio is saying, so deep learning started showing up in recommenders circa 2017, 2018. Um, but since recommenders doesn't have an image net, so recommenders did not have an image net moment. So, but, uh, it seems like on, from the outside, for those of us on the outside, we have the impression that deep learning is starting to dominate recommenders, yep. is yep. research. Is that, so if you do a quantitative analysis over the last 12 months, the percentage of papers that use deep learning has grown, right? Yes, I, I, I've not performed a quantitative analysis. Yeah. I've not counted you know, the, the ratio between deep versus non But based learning. on your gut, gut feeling yeah. is uh, for sure if uh, what is happening now is uh, you know from the very beginning if you submit a paper which is not uh, using deep learning you have to justify why your new algorithm is not a deep learning one or okay. or for that matter i think this has happened in computer vision and now starting to happen in language uh the new Mauricio. So, if Mauricio were to start grad school now, uh, he would be a deep learning based uh, uh, person in computer vision or natural language. And so, is that happening in recommenders as well? So, so the new generation of recommender researchers, uh, because Paolo just pointed out, Mauricio, that uh, conferences seem to lean towards uh, uh, deep learning. Yes, indeed. Um, while I was um, looking through the proceedings uh, during the, um, the, the the analysis that I was doing, I, I was observing that the number of deep learning papers was doubling every year. So uh, there is now a substantial number of articles that use deep learning. And so um, it is. Um, it actually happened to me once uh, a reviewer arg argued that I was doing something which could have been done more easily with deep learning. So uh, it is, it's, it's perhaps somewhat dominating on, on, on course to dominate the research field if uh, this growth continues. So uh, Mauricio, so give us a sense of, so you had the paper in 2019 and then the paper in 2021. And as uh, Paolo described, they're kind of part of a, both part of a bigger uh, research endeavor. So mm -hmm. what's the main thing about the 21, 2021 paper that is not in the 2019 paper? Well, in the 2021 paper, we went much more in depth in analyzing uh, the methodology and the type of analysis of the evaluation that was reported in the original paper. We also extended the number of uh, conferences and articles. Um, so we analyzed 26 papers and we reproduced 12. Um, and um, the conclusions that we draw are widely similar to the previous paper in that I believe only one of the neural model out of all, uh, all of the articles that we analyzed could be reproduced and was also competitive against a set of simple baselines. So the greatest majority of those papers was not uh, competitive against simple baselines. But we also encounter, we also uh, looked into um, methodological issues such as the way that the evaluation was done. For example, we saw that um, while training the model, you have a training for a certain number of epochs, half of the papers used the test data to decide which epoch they should stop the uh, training at. So informa information leakage. Uh, in the remaining half, I believe 
three of them did not report the criteria. So how did they decide the number of epochs was unclear. We observed cases where the test data was used to decide which items to sample during the training phase. Uh, so a number of substantial issues in the way the experiment was, uh, was done. Um, so what, uh, what, Mauricio, what's the reception so far of this 2021 paper? Well, um, we, we still have to, to present it at SIGAYAR. We will have this, this opportunity. So we, we don't have yet a first-hand um, audience feedback, um, but uh, we've seen a few citations going on already. So I believe that um, we, we also tried to, to, um, to suggest uh, guidelines and best practices, and these are being picked up by some uh, researchers. So I believe we we are having, we are starting a positive discussion on the way that an experiment should be should be uh, conducted in a reliable way. Because it's so, easy to do uh, an experiment. And, guidelines and practices as far as uh, basically how you how you yes, carry exactly. out research. Exactly. Um, and and Paolo, so um, I notice you also have been involved in some startups, right? Yep. Um, so on the one hand. I, I get what you folks are saying. The, the deep learning models were hard to reproduce or maybe not even that impressive and so on and so forth. But in many ways, uh, machine learning is an empirical field, right? So it's not, uh, it's not uh, completely uh, rigorous, I guess. Is the word. <laughs> there's, no, there's no exact theorems here. Yes, right? so, it's so it's exactly. all about the, the proof is in the results. Yes, so, but exactly. then I'm noticing though that uh, more and more of these big tech companies are shifting over over to deep learning. So, uh, and it started out even just search. So you can think of search as a top end kind of problem, right? So, but uh, but uh, maybe one can argue, well, they're doing that for other reasons uh, related to their technology infrastructure and tools and so on and so forth. But uh, there must be something about the results themselves that uh, that is shifting more of industry. So, what's your sense in terms of why is industry then starting to move inch towards deep learning for uh, recommenders and personalization? Um, um, so, the, the the feeling I have, uh, you are you are correct. Industry is moving uh, in in uh, this direction of using. Uh, even more deep learning uh, uh, for recommender systems, but not only for recommender systems. Uh, still, uh, uh, I have to say, you know, uh, I have this double side. I'm doing research uh, in the university, but uh, I'm also, you know, cooperating with a number of startups I've co-founded. And uh, uh, something I shouldn't say from, <laughs> from a research point of view is that in many real, applications we have with, with some of our customers, traditional old style collaborative filtering works uh, as well as uh, uh, some sophisticated deep learning technique. Not better maybe, but as well as. And, and um, here the trade-off is that, you know, now suppose you, you, you can invest, uh, I don't know, one week, one month in order to tune to train and tune an algorithm, okay? So if the algorithm is quite simple in its uh, architecture, you can devote a lot of time to fine tune the algorithm for the specific industrial domain. While if the algorithm is much more sophisticated, probably in a limited amount of time, you are not able to do the proper tuning of the algorithm. So this is an important trade-off. The, the, the other trade-off, uh, the other reason or, you know, um, why uh, the, in, in the two papers we, 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 you know, we, we saw these results about deep learning not uh, outperforming in a consistent way, um, simple business, is also because of the size of the data sets which are uh, normally used by the research community in order to test uh, recommender algorithms. So I have the feeling that the the problems which are traditionally used to benchmark recommender systems are too simple. Uh, there, there's no enough data in order to be able to get the, to obtain the best value from deep learning technique. And this is what, you know, when I was saying there are 
I prefer to create a taxonomy of our recommended systems based on the goal or the task. Uh, the top, top end um, recommendation task, it is the easiest. And probably deep learning is, uh, is not the best suited approach for this one, but there are many other tasks which are much more complex. And on, I, I believe that uh, on this task, deep learning is the only solution available. Yeah, may, so more, uh, Mauricio, maybe it is the case that uh, for the papers that you have looked at, is it possible that the data sets are just the, of the scale that where deep learning's uh, value is not showing true? That is highly likely. Um, some of the papers were evaluated on data sets with a few million data points. So um, it, there's likely not enough data. The signals that you are training the model on are not complex enough to, to, uh, to be able to get the value you, you could get from the complex model. So in more complex scenario with more heterogeneous data sources, it's highly likely that a neural model will be much more effective than a simple uh, 20-year-old KNN. So, uh, and also Paolo, I guess for if you go to industry, so there's scale, both in the size of the catalog items and users, there's latency. Uh, yes. There's maintainability because uh, yes. uh, deep learning, you might not have to do as much feature engineering maybe, uh, although you have to, isn't choosing the architecture some kind of feature engineering? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a different way of doing feature engineering. You're right. So, so there might actually be uh, other considerations besides pure uh, performance. There might be engineering considerations as well, right? But also, also for instance, I, I want to give you another example: explainability. Uh, what, what, you know, a recommended system is not only the algorithm. The algorithm is uh, only part. Uh, of a bigger application where the user interface is also important. And within the user interface, uh, you know, the, the goal of a recommended system at the very, very end is to help the user in, in finding something. So it is the user interface that helps the user. So if you, for instance, are able to provide a recommendation by writing why you are providing this recommendation to the user, the user will put more trust in the recommended system. And uh, the recommended system will be better in persuading the user. Uh, so and, another and, challenge. And, uh, you may have no choice because the EU regulators may ask you to provide the explanation. Also, uh, but even, yes, you are right. Uh, now there are <laughs> laws which are enforcing this. <laughs> You're right. But this was, uh, uh, let's say, an important issue even, even before you know, this uh, new EU regulation asking for this. Because if you want to, to help the user, you need to guide him or her uh, through the search. So if you explain why you are recommending something, the user will be more prone to trust you. And, uh, you know, the explainability, and the, the more complex is the algorithm, the more challenging, challenging is, to, is to explain uh, why you are recommending something. And this is true, especially for black box approaches. So Mauricio, I have a, two quick questions for you. The first is the guidelines that you alluded to in 2021. Um, are there any things in those guidelines that you think, uh, or maybe all of all of the entire guide set of guidelines, uh, are useful to people in industry, or are they are the guidelines geared towards people doing research? The guidelines are mainly aimed at people doing research. Um, which is some of them um, would perhaps apply to industry as well. But uh, for example, in an industry, in an industrial setting, if you want to deploy a system, you would uh, do an A-B testing. So for example, you would measure the user response to uh, your new recommender model. In this way, if your offline evaluation was done poorly, for some reason, you immediately see that the two don't match and that in practice, what you thought was a good solution is not effective in practice. So it, it would act as a stopgap. Whereas 
in um, in research you don't see uh, you you don't have usually this type of evaluation something which is really odd in the recommended system literature is that even though the recommended systems are aimed at users we don't we almost never show the recommendations those models provide to users we just use historical data sets so um so it's not we, real it's not real it's basically uh not real not real evaluation exactly exactly yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so another question for you, Mauricio, is uh, are there, so now that you've uh, been looking through this uh, uh, deep learning and recommenders for several years, are there clear design patterns that are emerging? Like uh, uh, people use convolutions, people do this or people do that. You know how in language people are coalescing around transformers, right? So are there common design patterns that are emerging that people seem to be coalescing around? Well, as far as I was able to see, um, there's no clear pattern that is emerging. Um, so wh when you talk about simpler data signals, uh, you have a very wide array of technologies that are deployed um, from you know, simple autoencoders to more complex convolution networks, although you don't have a topology in it. So perhaps the motivation- So, so, how, so how is the- uh... How, how how is the field progressing then? Is it basically just uh, your group likes using this kind of architecture, my group likes using this kind of architecture, I'll try this, you try that, then. So there's no, there's no, um, so yeah, so how, how, how are people systematically searching through the space of architecture? By enumeration, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> it's a combinatorial problem though. a combinatorial problem <laughs> yes so exactly. right now there are no there are no uh kind of uh there's no emerging kind of lessons like oh yeah stop trying that that doesn't work there are there, there are I, I see you know every year you see a little bust of uh, interest uh, on a specific uh, small aspects uh, of an architecture. But does or... it, uh, Paolo, does it, uh, does it, does that burst sustain over a couple of years or just flames out next year? There's another trend. Yeah, if, typically what I see is something that lasts for one uh, or no more than two years uh, and then you have another trend uh, and so on. So the, the bust that I'm seeing this year, for instance, one of the bust that I'm seeing this year is about uh, how to do the proper sampling of uh, interactions uh, from, a, from a data set in order to, you know, do, to build a better model, okay? So it's not on the architecture, but on how do we have to sample data. Uh, so these are, you know, really short uh, term, short lived bust of interest. And, um, so, Mauricio, there's kind of, it seems like there's a kind of a systemic challenge here if there's no, uh, if people are just trying things all over the place. Yes, um, this is partially is, I believe, due to the, the fact that we do not eliminate uh, venues that are not promising. Um, we do not publish negative results, so we don't ever find out what doesn't work. So, uh, for example, and we also, since we don't show what doesn't work, we don't have a clear idea of where should we perhaps try to uh, work harder, what type of issue we should address in order to have a certain you know, family of model uh, work better or adapted to, to our scenario. So the fact that we are doing evaluation in a, let's say, creative way or incomplete, uh, makes us somewhat blind in, to, to which are the um, important things that we should do in order to get the, the to improve the, the, the quality of our models. And this uh, is perhaps one of the reasons why I see an enumeration of archi architectures. So different groups trying to combine different, uh, different pieces that are attached components. So you, you get the attention out and you put a memory uh, model, you put a groove there, and then you build a model, and you show the results, and that's it. There's no follow-up, there is no um, further discussion, or it, it, you rarely see research work that builds 
on uh, on top of each other. So Paolo, I just came up with three research directions for your lab for the next 10 years. The first oh, I, is to I establish <laughs> is to have a massive data set, kind of like the image net for recommenders, although that's an impossible thing because uh, there's so many different kinds of items and, and things to recommend, right? The second is um, this notion that Mauricio said, which is to uh, come up with a system where you can actually test the recommenders models against uh, live users, uh, some kind of website. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and then, and then uh, three, a kind of a knowledge base for recommender research where uh, negative results are also in this knowledge base somehow. How does that sound as a 10 year? Uh... <laughs> this is, uh, th these uh, ideas and research challenges are fantastic. And uh, I would like to tell but you none, that none of them have you did you notice none of them are really models they're all infrastructure in, in, yes. infrastructure yeah 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 yes uh and i have to tell uh, to be honest uh, the second one you you were mentioning i did try uh, to set up this it is uh, not easy okay it is uh, expensive somehow and uh, it works if you're able to attract uh, uh a large community of users. Uh, so, and I am still pushing on on the on the number two. Uh, as for the number one, uh, building uh, this what we, we, a kind of image net like uh, data set for recommended system, I totally agree. Uh, it could be even if it is not one data set, it can, it can be a collection of data sets. But you have to prove that you are doing well on all of them if you want to improve the state of the art. And um, as, uh, and uh, as for the third one, uh, it's really important. I, I, I didn't think of it, uh, but uh, uh, it's a really a good uh, infrastructural and methodological uh, important challenge for the community. So Mauricio, is, the, is, there, uh, is it easy to organize the recommender system community? You know, at least, uh, for example, uh, uh, in language, they have conferences, you know, I mean, more or less, you know, where people go. Uh, same thing with computer vision, speech as well, to some extent. So recommenders, you have the Rexis conference, but, uh, there's some, but there's some overlap with the information retrieval people, right? I mean, yes. search and stuff. Uh, so how would you, how if you were to build such a knowledge base, how I mean, you would have to kind of attract participation from... Uh, multiple communities in some ways, right? Yes. Um, it, it would be a challenging task to bring together community communities which are from different backgrounds and see the um, this, this task from different points of view. Uh, information retrieval is one, but we see we have also um, groups that deal with uh, image recognition because you can use this type of multimedia data in uh, recommender systems. So it is, um, it is a topic with connection to a number of uh, heterogeneous groups with heterogeneous communities. So it, it, it would be rather challenging to bring all of them together. So one area that uh, Paolo alluded to where I think uh, uh, deep learning might have an advantage uh, is multimodality, right? So mm -hmm. if you have recommenders using exactly. many different data types. So, so there, uh, it doesn't seem like what else would you use? <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, because because computer I mean, computer vision is dominated by deep learning, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, and in that case, uh, you you, of course, uh, you need deep learning. Uh, and uh, and, to... and, uh, and Paolo, it's not kind of like a holy grail for recommender people. It's to multimodal. Is or like uh, the in the dream scenario, you have an AI that's using signals from all sorts of yeah. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, you know, uh, my my vision is to have, you know, for, is for the recommended system to be a kind of a personal assistant, someone or something in this case that knows you very, very well and is able to predict your needs. You know, by, so it's, by it's, it's, it's using uh, text, speech, exactly, your exactly. facial expressions, the facial expression, all 
everything I hear, everything I look at. So, so you, you need to, to, to use all um, different modalities uh, in, in order to, you know, it's, it's, this is the way how we do react. And this is the way uh, how we take decisions. So the, the perfect, if, <laughs> if you can think about a perfect recommended system has to be a multimodal recommended system for sure. And uh, you're right, this uh, is the, the holy grail of, uh, of recommended systems. And, uh, and I think that, um, you know, one little step uh, at a time, we, we are going in this direction, but um, I, I'm going back to, to what you, we are calling the, to, to do ImageNet example. Uh, even in that case, uh, you need, uh, we need, as a the research community, we need our image net of uh, multimodal data set uh, where we can, we can benchmark our research. Because you, you see, there are a lot of publications, for instance, about um, multimodal recommended systems, but almost all of them are from the industry and, uh, are, and, and the research is performed on um, private data sets. So the industrial research community is progressing somehow in this, in this direction with the speed, that, uh, with the pace, which is different from the academic research community because we, as the academic research community, we do not have access to these data sets. And, uh, and so without uh, having access to these data sets, we cannot even think about uh, uh, building uh, our image in it. That's why more and more uh, professors in Stanford and Berkeley are spending time in, <laughs> in, in these uh, big tech companies, right? So that's basically, uh, that's how you get access to data and compute. And speaking of which, uh, Mauricio, uh, data and compute, right? So to the extent that they become barriers, you know, like in language, it's becoming kind of a problem, right? I mean, do, to train one of these uh, transformer models can cost you half a million dollars. <laughs> and and that, that's if you actually uh, set it up properly, you know, if, uh, if you made a mistake, well, it will cost you more. Uh, so to the extent that compute and data become barriers, um, it's gonna be a challenge for recommenders, right? I mean, uh, reproducibility, uh, mm -hmm not only the reproducibility itself, but also the development of the ability to conduct research itself as problems become more complex and models become more complex. If I need a week of a high-end GPU to, to train a single instance of a model, I'm never going to be able to do experiments unless I have a significant budget. And so... Yeah, it's an arms race. This... It's an arms race. To some extent. Right, yes. right, 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 and, right. And that's assuming that, uh, uh, so you have the high end GPUs, but then you might have a cluster, you might need a cluster of them, or you might even start using some of these specialized uh, accelerators, like TPUs yes. or Cerebras or whatever. But uh, then the barrier to uh, the reproducibility becomes even more of a problem. Right, because exactly. you can be the most transparent person. Here's everything I did. Here's all the steps. But by the way, it'll cost you two million to do what I just yeah. did. Yeah, right? exactly, exactly. And uh, you just have to, you have to trust me then, right? Yeah, and and I'm wondering uh, how this is managed in other communities within the machine learning uh, research. Uh, you know. Uh, no, no, it's uh, it's 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 a problem. That's why a lot of people are just basically. Uh, uh, starting to use pre-trained models, right? So, um, but that's, I, I don't know if that recommenders are so specific to your context and domain. I mean, is there, uh, is there a kind of a transfer learning in recommenders? Y yes, there has been in the past. I mean, that, that, that actually works. In, in in practice, like uh, you take a recommender that someone built and it's so cool for his his or her domain and then you transfer learn it to yours. Has, have you ever actually seen that in the wild? So there has been, uh, till a few years ago, uh, 
a huge hype of research on this, uh, but before deep learning came out, uh, you know, for for a type of problem which is called the cross-domain recommendation problem, where uh, where you want to learn a model from a source domain and then you want to transfer the uh, the knowledge or the or the model to a target domain. Uh, so the, the, there was a, there's been a lot of uh, work on this, uh, uh, not so much uh, since uh, the advent of deep learning. And uh, as far as I know, no work uh, was the, um, tailored for the, let's say, scalability problem. That is, uh, I want to use, uh, I want to transfer the model with the only purpose to avoid the retraining. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, this is this is a fantastic research <laughs> challenge because all the research work along transfer. But, uh, but uh, the so the the scenario would be as follows, though, Mauricio. Right. So I train. I have this fantastic, the world's best recommender for movies, right? And now I'm going to transfer, learn it to books. I mean. Will that work? Um, I mean, uh, under any scenario, <laughs> that brings its own challenges. Right. Uh, for example, it is not. Or, or maybe, maybe, is... yeah. So let's make it slightly easier, right? So I have this fantastic world's best uh, recommender for English movies. I'm now going to transfer learn it to Italian movies. That is possible uh, if you have some connection between uh, the two domains, if you have some users in common, if you have some features in common, or if you have some movies in common. Uh, this, is, uh, this has been researched. There are a few examples of it. It becomes more difficult uh, the further apart the two domains are. So if you try to, to take uh, something that was trained on English movies and you want to use it for, I don't know, Japanese comic books, um, whether you're able to find a way to do that, it's not clear. So there is, yeah, the, it's, the, it's limited in some way. As, as Paolo pointed out, one of the main motivations is to avoid retraining, right? Uh, Paolo, in, in language, this yeah. language models, this is a, this is a thing because basically the these big uh, Sesame Street models, Elmo, Bird, whatever, no. uh, are expensive to train. So then you you try to take advantage of the pre-trained model to the best you can fine-tune it for your purpose. And, uh, you know, the, the, all the research of this, as I was telling, uh, on recommended systems was uh, mostly uh, focused, uh, and, and this mostly focused it non, uh, not on avoiding retraining, but on proving that uh, by using transfer learning plus our retraining, you are able to do better than, you know, a traditional approach without transfer learning. Uh, but uh, but the, the, let's say the, the challenge, the, the problem you were pointing out is uh, really uh, important. Uh, it's not only an industrial problem, it's also uh, a research problem because uh, if you can use transfer learning in an effective way, you can take advantage of some, you know, BERT-like <laughs> pre-trained model for recommended systems and, and use it uh, on a different domain. But uh, again, in order to have this uh, uh, fantastic uh, model that you can transfer somewhere else, uh, the original model has to be, uh, let's say, a uh, well done model, trained on a huge data set and so on. And again, we are in, in this loop where the research community um, has difficulties in uh, accessing uh, uh, huge data sets for recommended systems where, where you can train a model, a model with a lot of parameters. Um, so uh, unless, you know, maybe there are su such data sets, but uh, for very specific niche, uh, problems uh, and um, so I, I think, uh, but this is an, an interesting discussion. So let me uh, uh, try to wind it down by uh, discussing some recent trends. And so the first one is something to uh, uh, keep Mauricio up at night even more than deep learning, <laughs> which, is re which, is, which is reinforcement learning. So Mauricio. I'm starting to see people, <laughs> companies, 
I mean, talk about reinforcement learning for personalization and recommendation. So it's not many. We're talking a handful. So let me uh, uh, list out the ones that I know have publicly talked about or written about uh, what they're doing. So YouTube, uh, I think uh, RL to uh, as part of the recommender pipeline, maybe to narrow down from, you know, this much to this much, right? So, uh Facebook has alluded to RL, re reinforcement learning for personalization and recommendation. And Netflix, but more, mo mostly in the context of bandits, but bandits, one can say, is kind of a form of, uh, of reinforcement learning. Some Chinese companies are doing it for recommenders. JD.com is the one that has published something. And then I'm actually about to publish a post on Fortune 1000 companies and reinforcement learning. Uh, and I noticed a couple of companies had job postings. You know, we're looking for people who to help us with our personalization and recommenders who can do reinforcement learning. Um, so reinforcement learning and reproducibility, uh, that's pretty tough, right? So first of all, uh, now you're not talking about just having access to the data, but maybe um, either the simulator, which it's not going to happen. They're not going to give you a simulator. Uh, or you have to learn offline from logs somehow uh, what they did. So, but uh, yeah, so reinforcement learning is starting to appear in recommenders. This is not a good thing for your rec reproducibility. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so yes. what's your thoughts, uh, and have you been hearing uh, uh, this as well? Well, um, as far as I know, there hasn't been much research into uh, this specific topic in the conferences that we that I am well uh, am involved in. Uh, but there will be probably in the future. So. Uh, let me put a pin on that, and in 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 a year or so, we will we will have something more substantive to discuss, I believe. And uh, I can add a little bit on on, on top of this, uh, uh, mentioning another company which is using heavily reinforcement learning for recommended system, which is Criteo. It is okay. a French company. Right, right, right. Uh, Criteo. Yeah, yeah. And um, so what this is it? public. They've talked about it publicly, uh, Paolo? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, they they also published, uh, you know, a um, few papers on this. Uh, and they also released the simulator. Okay. Uh, um, so, which has not gained too much success in the research community, uh, as far as I what, know. What, uh, what uh, time frame, what year was this? I I don't remember exactly. If you want, I can later offline send yeah. you the the the. I would say two two years or three years ago. Yeah. Uh, and I can send you the 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 reference to the papers and also to the simulator. Uh, the, it was a workshop paper. Just to mention that uh, you know this publication uh, had uh, say a limited visibility in the in, at least in the Rexis community. Uh, because uh, one of the reasons, of course, is uh, the difficulty in reproducing uh, our experiments and also, you know, setting up a proper baseline and so on. But I agree that uh, this is one of the possible future of recommended systems, at least from the industrial point of view, for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. The other, the other trend, of course, as you guys know, is auto ML. Um, and you know, take a step back. Maybe uh, the road to at auto ML uh, goes through declarative interfaces, right? So where you just uh, like a SQL for recommenders, where you just declare this is what I want to do, and then the system will just uh, do it for you. Um, so is there auto ML in Rexis, Mauricio? Is that in the future of Rexis? Well, um, I believe that as uh, for enforcement learning, I haven't seen much development on this uh, on this issue on this on this uh, topic. But um, there yeah. may be some. Here, here's the data. Give me the recommend. 
<laughs> yeah. So is it uh, is it science fiction at this point? It depends on the data, I would say. But, well, I mean, combine deep learning with neural architecture search. So two computationally expensive things, uh, and, and but uh, it's within the realm of possible if you had the computation. <laughs> yes. It's, it's, it, it, it's in the realm of possibility and it is perhaps automating some type of some some form of the greedy search that we do as, as researchers in, our, in, arch in architecture search architecture yes. search as well so Paolo is this within the realm of five years ten years I, I would say so uh, again this is something that uh, I was thinking of uh, I don't know ten years ago when deep learning uh, and uh, you know, architecture search were not even probably ideas uh, and uh, had no hint on how to do this. Uh, uh, you know, and probably auto ML is more feasible if you focus on an, you know, a specific application type. So, and recommended systems could be one of these application area. Right. Uh, because, you know, the problem is somehow very specific, uh, even if you apply you know, even if you want to build a recommended system for books or for movies and so on, you know, some, you, you can, you know, the, the, the exploration space uh, uh, is somehow more limited than a general purpose auto ML. Yeah, and the trend seems to be in most of technology is to make it more accessible to developers and eventually non-programmers, right? So, so for example, now in language, you do have tools where developers can can build uh, language applications without uh, being experts in NLP or any of these uh, fancy models. So final trend, responsible AI, which is an umbrella term that captures things like fairness and bias, privacy and security, safety and reliability. Um, what is what is responsible AI in the context of Rexis, I guess explainability is the obvious thing, but is is responsible AI a thing in the Rexis community? Is it something that people are talking about, Mauricio? Well, uh, there is, uh, yes. Short answer, yes. Uh, there are communities that work and have been working, for example, on fairness for many years at this point. Uh, there has been... Uh, Which is a big thing, by the way, in recommenders. That's a big... Yes, I mean, yes. many of the examples that you read about our recommenders, right? So. It has enormous implications because since it guides our interaction with the system, it guides what type of content we are exposed to, it guides what type of job opportunities we are uh, presented by uh, social network, uh, it guides what type Disin of artists get interaction. Disinformation, so. disinformation, right? So. Yes, 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 yes. Right. So it has it has huge implications. Um, it is. It, it, it somewhat intersects with the business model of the company, with the way the company uh, merges the, the systems and has its but business it, rules set up. So, so is there an emerging set of best practices in the Raxis community for responsible AI? I believe that there is a wider discussion going on. Going on. Um, I'm not sure we have coalesced yet around a more structured set of guidelines, but the discussion is progressing at an increased pace. So, Paolo. I'm probably, uh, when going again along on this direction, uh, something that uh, is, is emerging is to uh, include uh, um, new metrics when evaluating a recommended system. So not only based on, on relevance, but also based, for instance, on diversity and novelty and coverage and so on. So, this is a somehow a trend uh, which is happening uh, in all uh, in all uh, of our experiments. We also we always include these uh, non-relevant uh, metrics uh, in the evaluation of recommended systems. And sometimes uh, I'm um, um, thinking that uh, in order to implement uh, fairness in a recommended system, inst instead of trying to build a fair model, it is easier to to put rules at the end, <laughs> at the output yeah. of the model to make it become, you know, 
fair if the model is not fair somehow. Right, 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 right. But you know, machine learning people are, are, are opposed. Yes, to, uh... <laughs> yes, yes. I know, I know. Uh, I, 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 again, I'm talking from the pragmatical point yeah, of yeah. view, and you have to do this in the industry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So, final question for both of you, which is basically: so we talked about two survey papers that you wrote, evaluating uh, deep learning for recommenders, and I mean, so the overall finding is one the the at least in the research uh, space uh, deep learning for recommenders one hard to reproduce the results that people are are producing and then secondly uh it's a mixed bag uh many of the many of the deep learning models seem to be on par or maybe even underperform simpler models so with that said fast forward five years from now uh, how dominant will deep learning be in recommenders and personalization? So, so let's start with the postdoc first, Mauricio, and then uh, have the director of the lab. All right, so Mauricio, on the spot, five years from now, I will play this back, this episode back. So, uh, Tough question. Uh, uh, if we, we've been able to address the issues uh, in the way we conduct experiments, in terms of the research community, then I believe that deep learning will still be there because we will we will have uh, more. But no, no, no. The question is, question is how dominant. Oh, how dominant? Yeah. Uh, well, maybe it will still be a rather dominant, but with different types of uh, architectures and different types of technologies than what so, we see now. So five years from now, if you talk to someone, Paolo. Uh, a student who's uh, or a, a new a, a professor joining your group in recommenders, uh, will they know anything beyond deep learning? Or they, or they, they, were, the... they were they were schooled completely in deep learning? No, no. The deep learning will be a commodity. It will be the new baseline, and they will learn about quantum based machine learning. <laughs> 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 you know, I I had I have this joke book where I say, yeah, I'm I'm writing a book. It's uh, what is it? Decentralized quantum deep learning on the blockchain. Yeah, Com <laughs> combines all of combining the all the all the <laughs> all the keywords. <laughs> no, no. So, Paolo, seriously, five years from now, recommenders, how dominant uh, is deep learning? Uh, no, I was sitting when I was saying that uh, deep learning, I, I believe, will be a commodity. Uh, uh, so it will be the standard way of doing uh, uh, recommended systems. Uh, uh, and uh, by even if uh, not by using AutoML, I believe with uh, uh, something maybe in between, uh, you know, uh, handcrafted architecture and a totally AutoML approach, there will be something with a degree of flexibility that you just plug into <laughs> into your problem but for and for this to happen uh, as mauricio pointed out and i guess you pointed out earlier as well uh, deep learning needs to really uh, dominate in the size and the types of data sets that are available to researchers right because it seems like uh, we're speculating that for the big companies they have access to data and they have infrastructure and they have workflows that where deep learning makes a lot of sense to use. But for the research community where uh, the data is a lot less limited, it's not yet clear. And by the way, um, this also seems to be happening in other areas uh, now beyond uh, speech, vision, and, and, uh, and uh, text. So structured data, so two areas in particular, time series and tabular data. So time series, you're starting to see people use deep learning. Tabular data with tabnet, people are starting to use deep learning. Now, I I tried both of those. Uh, yeah, so the, there's advantages, there's no feature engineering, but it's slower than the traditional methods. Uh, and then maybe you get, debatable maybe you get some marginal improvement here and there but you feel good because you're using deep learning by the way 
<laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, exactly. But, uh, but the trend seems to be, okay, so that's fine. It's not dominant yet, but there's no feature engineering. Maybe we can make it dominate in the future. But the slowness is still, you know, if you ever work on time series using the classical methods, they're just blazing fast compared to deep learning, right? So I imagine for classic methods and recommenders, they're blazing fast compared to deep learning. And then right now, deep learning, it's not, it's not it's at the cusp where it's not clear whether it's better or not, but it's trendy. So the younger researchers will gravitate towards it and maybe make it better. And then maybe I'll start uh, being uh, faster, but then, uh, and then someone will come up a way to accelerate it using specialized hardware. But a lot of things have to fall in place. It seems like even in recommenders for this to really uh, uh, happen. But uh, I have a kind of, uh, you know, sort of symmetric question for you <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> is how much deep a deep learning method has to be in order to be a deep learning method because oh, I, think, you know, <laughs> I think it doesn't have to be that deep as long as you're using uh, neural nets yes so right? you know no. you you can you can use uh, uh, neural nets uh, with you know not too many layers so, so you, you you but then you, but you then find, uh, Paolo, if you don't have that many layers, sometimes it doesn't work as well, right? Even for simpler problems. Uh, you're right. Well, well, it depends on the data. And as I was saying, you know, if... Uh, uh, so when you were asking me if uh, the research community in five years will use deep learning, I would say yes, uh, but... Uh, and tailored on the size of the problems, uh, um, the community will... Uh, or, or what about my, my speculation being... It's a trendy thing. The younger researchers will work on it, like Mauricio. Not that Mauricio is chasing trends, but uh, they will make it dominate even in the smaller data sets. Is that a possible scenario, Mauricio? I suppose it's possible. Uh, we have to get a few things right before we do. So there will be some, some work to see whether it is possible or not. But, but uh, it's clearly the incentive for the young researchers is to use deep learning, right? Rather than, uh, I mean, why, why would I work on KNN, right? Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> right? So, so, <laughs> so it seems like uh, it. But the one thing that, so Mauricio, one last question. I keep saying one last question, but this is the last question. Uh, <laughs> per performance. Um, what is do you find the deep learning models that you try to reproduce significantly uh, slower? Uh, between 10 and 100 times, considering that we were using a CPU for the baselines and uh, Tesla V100 for the deep learning models. So that was uh, substantially uh, slower. But in that case, you should consider that those are not um, product grade implementations. So they are research somewhat uh, proof of concept so but aside from these perhaps extremely slow uh, implementations there is indeed a dimension in terms of are we really getting much advantage for the huge computational cost we need to sustain and uh, if i recall correctly in one of the recent articles of facebook where they discussed their um, deep learning models they said that at some point they only took into account the interaction between the second order interaction and going much higher didn't provide much advantage so um, there, is, there is a point where uh, we could go in ever more complex models, but maybe part, partly because of the data and partly because of the, uh, of the type of behavior that we want to model, we, are, we, we encounter a limit after which it's, it doesn't really make sense to, to, to go more complex. And with that, thank you both. This is great. This is one of the best discussions I've had on something... Uh... Uh, that touches pretty much everyone's lives every day, basically. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you.